Evening ladies and gents, it's uh, Simon Brown here, not as doing the presentation, this is, as we always know, well beyond my remit. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Keith, he's the expert in the space. We're going to try dis discounted cash flows. Uh, as we said, this is the third of three parts, we'll be back in December, we'll do a case study on this to give it some practical experience so that we can understand it, uh, and it very much fits into the, the valuations, and just before we went on air, Keith was saying, this is probably the end of the valuations. We'll do the case study in December, and then we'll come back in, in 2013 and do some kind of throwing it all together. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, guys, for joining us. Um, just to recap, and uh, I, I love recaps because it puts everything in context. Uh, we're still looking at the fundamentals of equity, and I still define them as the four pillars, which is profitability, really the aim of the business, liquidity, cash is king, solvency, debt versus risk, management, the qualitative factors, because you're actually buying a business that is assets that need to be run by people. So you're investing in the people. This all leads one to understand the four pillars of fundamentals. It leads to valuation. And the valuation, as great as the story is, you're buying a valuation. So make sure your valuation is correct and that leads to an investment decision. There is a video on justonelap.com of the four pillars. And I'll touch on it later. There's also because we, we're going to be using it, there is another webinar on the cost of equity and WAC. I'd also recommend going back and refreshing yourselves on that. Um, types of valuations, you get relative valuations, price earnings, price to book, all of these are paying the valuation on moving targets, other companies, other traded shares. Um, sometimes those are wrong. This is why we get absolute valuations of which we, uh, we've done the discounted uh, dividend discount model. We're doing the discounted free cash flow, DCF model. Um, just recapping on what, exactly what the cost of equity is, it's the required rate of return shareholders demand for accepting the risk of providing share capital. Big word of saying, if I'm taking a risk, I have to be paid for it. How much is it worth? Um, the greater the risk, the higher the cost of equity. The greater the discount rate. Then WAC. The weighted average cost of capital is the total cost of a firm's capital. Don't forget, firms don't just use equity, some of them use debt, and different types of debt, preference shares, debentures, long-term loans, even overdraft accounts. Um, and in this case, depending on how geared you are, you might use the cost of equity or, or the WAC, but uh, I would certainly revisit that a webinar on cost of equity for much more detail, just refresh yourselves on it. It will certainly make a lot more sense uh, when, when I start discounting free cash flows here, but uh, that, that, that's for your homework. Then recapping on free cash flow, yes, there are a lot of recaps in this because we've done a lot. Uh, the definition of free cash flow is basically operating cash flows less the capital expenditure. Don't forget you have to spend money to earn money. The free cash flow is how much you've got after that. That's what an operating cash flow minus capital expenditures. The formula, the formula for free cash flow is EBIT post-tax, that's why it's one minus the tax rate, plus depreciation and amortization, these are the non-cash flow items, less the change in working capital. Now sometimes it can actually be plus the change in working capital, but more, more than likely it's less the, the change in working capital, less capex, the capital expenditure in business because you're obviously reinvesting the business, well, we hope you're reinvesting the business to grow it. So the DCF model assumes a company's fair value is the present value of all its future free cash flows. I'm not going to explain what the present value is, um, uh, and, and if you don't understand what it is, I fully encourage you to Google that. Present value, and perhaps even net present value, NPV, uh, basically, free cash flows in the future, if I gave you one rand now, or I gave you one rand in 10 years' time, which one's worth more? I think we'd all agree the one rand right now is worth more, because money loses its value the further in the future it is. So this is why we are present valuing the free cash flows. There are really two main parts of the DCF model. It's the future free cash flows of the company, then you've got to present value them. Um, in the first part, of the DCF model part one, we looked at what is the free cash flow. So we've got to define it. Before we can forecast the free cash flow, we've got to understand 
what is the free cash flow. Then in part two, we looked at, okay, now I understand what the free cash flow is. How do you forecast it? What are the complications in forecasting it? Finally, in this third part, we are present valuing it. To arrive at a fair value, and that fair value will dictate our investment decision. So that's the recaps. And if you'd seen the previous webinar about forecasting free cash flow, you would recognize, you will recognize this graphic. Where in the present day, this is us, the awesome guy with the rocket. And you're looking at EBIT post tax, plus minus working capital, less capex, and so down to free cash flow, and you're forecasting it for multiple periods in the future. All the way until the terminal year, where the steady state growth continues from there which is a massive assumption that we'll touch on later. And there's a lot of things to consider. Um, this is the graph from the previous one. What do I mean by present valuing free cash flows? This is what I mean. All of these are free cash flows in the future. We drop all of them down and we pull them to the future. The further out they are from the present, the, the more we discount them. And that is what discounting free cash flow is, in a nutshell. If you can understand that, the rest of this webinar is probably redundant. But there's technicalities, particularly around this terminal growth year. So, whereas in, in, uh, next webinar, I will be doing a, a case study. And the case study will, in fact, be ISA Limited, Information Security Architects Limited. Um, but... Let me use a really, really rough uh, theoretical example here. So this is Keith Awesome Empire Limited. You know, it's a global group and it does really, really well because um, everything that named after people does really, really well. And uh, we are going to DCF it quickly. Um, and let's make a certain massive, massive assumptions. We're using a three-year time period and we're assuming that EBITDA grows by 10%. Now remember, if you go back to what is a free cash flow, there's EBIT, post-tax, plus minus a more, uh, plus non-cash flow item, depreciation and amortization. EBIT plus depreciation and amortization is EBIT DAR. This is where the EBIT DAR comes. I've already added back the depreciation and the amortization. So I've just gotten the cash level of the income statement. So we are assuming that our EBIT is growing by 10%. So you can see 100 EBIT, in this case 100,000 becomes 110, 121, 133, and so on. Then we're stripping our tax. We're making the assumption that tax is 30%, which is also a big assumption. We're stripping out the tax now that is the 100 less the 30, so it's 100 times uh, 30%. This is where we get the tax from. Uh, cutting that out because tax is, is a cost to a business. We are also making the assumption that working capital, capex, and tax all track EBITDA. So working capital is not getting tighter, it's not getting looser, it's not anything. Debtors days, creditors days, inventory days, all static. Um, and CapEx, we're spending maybe uh, the, the uh, consumable part of our uh, property plant and equipment is going to consume per annum that we're having to uh, reapply it. Hence, CapEx will track EBITDA. So we're just simply tracking all of these. Where EBIT, basically, in this model, forecasting EBITDA pushes down to all these numbers. And so, in year one, we get our free cash flow, which is EBIT which is uh, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization, less tax, less the working capital, less the capex, and we left with free cash flow of 55,000 rand. Apparently, Keith Empire isn't that big. <laughs> and um, now, now, now we have this line item called, and you can see it going progressing. The 110 in year two becomes 63, 66 term in year 72. So you can see it growing because good companies should grow. Now we have the discount factor. Discount factor is, and this is where um, I, I, I'm pointing it out, it's based on the time value of money. Where you present value it, 
this is beyond this webinar, so I won't linger on it. If it confuses you, uh, Google it. It's, it's actually quite a simple formula. In fact, if you work in Excel, Excel has a function for it, and you can go and find it. Um, so all we're doing is we're assuming in year one, we're discounting one rand back at the weighted average cost of capital, which in Keith Empire, because Keith doesn't believe in debt, uh, so the cost of equity is the way, because there's no debt, and I make it 15%. So we're present valuing one rand for one year uh, at 15%. And we can see that the discount factor is 0.87. And then as you go further in the future, you can see that discount factor get bigger and well, smaller and smaller. Uh, and so when the free cash flow times by the discount factor allows us to arrive at the discounted free cash flow. 55 times 0.87 is 47.8. I know I'm throwing a lot, around, a lot of numbers around here. There's not to confuse you. But unfortunately, evaluations include numbers, so, so I can't get away from it. But you can see that each year, that discount factor hits that free cash flow. And in fact, even though it grew in year two to 60 uh, free cash flow, the WAC was 15%. So the discount factor grew bigger. So in year two, that 60% discounted to the present is 45, which is actually less than year one. And then we get a really strange thing in the terminal year, which... Um, I will explain in a moment, so don't get confused by that. 72 times 0.57 is not 343, but I'll get to that. Just assuming, uh, in, in, in uh, looking forward that you understand this, uh, add up all of these and you get to a value of 479.6, 479,600 Rand. And that is the net present value. Now, that isn't the fair value. Because don't forget, we've been discounting at WAC. Um, and in this case, because it's an ungeared company, WAC has no debt. But you're still calculating the enterprise value. Now, if you don't understand what the enterprise value is, go and revisit the webinar where I have a look at the EV EBITDA model. I spend a lot of time explaining what enterprise value is. Basically, it's the total value of equity in the business plus the total value of the funding, debt, both added together. In Keep Empire, we are a little cash flush, so we've got no debt, but we have 10,000 Rand. So 479 enterprise value plus the extra cash we have allows us to arrive at the equity value. And the equity value is simply the two added together, which is the fair value of equity is 489,600 Rand. Keith Empire really isn't that big. So remember this point where I mentioned this terminal value and how 72 times 0 .8, 0 0.57 is not 343. Well, this is why, because the terminal value is a particularly unique part of DCF, but it's quite important to wrap your head around. Now, all of DCFs of non-finite assets. Now, let me give you an example of a finite asset. A finite asset is, for example, a mine, a single mine, not an angler that has a portfolio and, and business model, just a single mine. A single mine, you spend a lot of money up front to build the mine, then you spend the rest of the time uh, paying OPEX, operating expenses, to dig the stuff out of the ground, and once everything's out of the ground, there is no more mine. It's finite. Thereafter, you've sold all the minerals, and what you have is what you have. This DCF is a non-finite company. We assume in Keith Empire has a fantastic business model and will continue operating forever. So in the terminal value, what we do is we assume a stable growth for infinity. Now, yes, that is an unrealistic assumption, but unfortunately, your evaluation is not actually a science, it's closer to an art. Uh, so we have to make certain simplifying assumptions because um, last time I checked my crystal ball wasn't working perfectly. So we assume growth is at infinity in the, in the future in the terminal year. And 
often the assumption with the terminal year is that this is the X growth year. The company stops growing and just starts tracking its natural growth without reinvesting aggressively or anything like that. So you arrive at the terminal value. Um, now, remember I said how it's X growth? When in doubt, peg the X growth terminal year growth rate, because this assumption is 10% EBITDA growth per year. In the terminal year, what I assume is uh, I assume I often assume real GDP growth because think about it: if your company is growing for forever and it's growing faster than the economy, eventually it will be the economy. Maybe in a billion years' time, but it will be the economy. So often, the terminal year you need a pretty damn good reason not to use real GDP growth as your terminal year growth rate. Then, because it's growing at this real GDP growth, or whichever one you peg it to, and it's growing for infinity, what we actually have is we have a unique time value of money formula. It's called a perpetuity. And the perpetuities formula in this case is the free cash flow divided by the WAC or cost of equity, cost of equity if there's no gearing, WAC if there is gearing, less the terminal growth rate times the discount rate. In this case, it will be the terminal, terminal year, free cash flow, multiplied by the real GDP, or multiplied by 15% less the real GDP rate, which is maybe 3.5%, 3, 3 um, divided by that, and then multiplied by the discount factor. So 72 divided by, let's say, 0.12 is actually quite a lot. But then multiplied by the discount factor, it drops to 300 and 63. Um, really confusing, but I cannot emphasize how important, what the, uh, how, how important the terminal year is. The reason is, it's because the DCF is, always, is often incredibly sensitive, depending on the terminal year. In this case, above, the net present value, when I say net present value, I say this part, where you're just adding up all the free cash flows, the net present value do you see how 363.1 in the terminal year is actually 71% of that net present value? So the terminal year is often a massive weighting in your DCF. So think very, and, and the, the biggest influence in your terminal year is often your terminal growth rate. So think long and hard about if you're going to add a premium or a discount to the real GDP growth there. So I spent a lot of time on that, and I'm expecting, and actually I'm hoping there's a lot of questions, because uh, uh, DCF really has three parts, working out the free cash flows, we've, we've, we've touched on that. Then you've got to understand intricacies of forecasting it. Now we've seen the practical aspect of using the WAC and the cost of equity to discount it, so that you arrive at an enterprise value, uh, strip out debt or add in net cash. Net cash is obviously debt less cash, and if there's more cash than debt, we call it net cash. Um, and you arrive at the value of the equity. But think carefully about the terminal value assumptions. So I strongly advise you, that if I've confused the hell out of you, revisit the cost of equity and WAC webinar for a refresher and perhaps even look at the part one and part two of, of the DCF. Note the complexity and number of assumptions in the DCF. What I mean by that is EBITDA, I have an assumption for that line. Tax, I have an assumption for that line. Working capital, I have an assumption for that line. CapEx, more assumptions. The discount factor is based on the WAC and which is based on the cost of equity and the debt funding, which is an assumption. Then in the terminal year, I have terminal growth rate, which is yet another assumption. So the as powerful as the DCF model is, it's incredibly exposed to the complexity and number of assumptions in it. Get some of them wrong, you get it wrong. But this is also where it starts to become quite powerful because if you get them right, you can see beyond short-term earnings and you can see the long-term value in a company. So the next webinar is really the case study of the DCF. Like I said, I'll be using um, uh, ISA, 
Uh, as a disclaimer, I own the share, uh, so, so you're more than likely to guess where that DCF will end up. But uh, it, it, it's a company I'm quite comfortable with, and a DCF where you need lots of assumptions, you need to work with the company now quite well. So we open for questions here. I hope uh, there's still somebody online. <laughs> yeah, and, and just a double back disclaimer, I own it too, and we'll date stamp this 7 November 2012 in case you listen to this way down the road. Keith, I've got a question here. There's a couple of questions. Folks, if you've got them, put them in the question box. I like this one loads. From uh, Caroline, and Caroline, if I've got it wrong, then, then retweet the question. Backward integration. I think I'm understanding what she's saying. So we do a couple of different models so that we get to valuations, and we find the DCF that kind of sits in the middle of that. Now we can start to say that the assumptions we've made are perhaps more accurate because it congregates around your other different valuation mechanisms that you've used. Well, the, the, the perfect, um, uh, let me, uh, I'll show the phrases. The perfect three models I like to use, and I almost always use them in combination with other ones, is the price earnings, the price of the book, and the DCF. The reason being, is that the price earnings is often not based on short-term profitability. The price of the book is often based on balance sheet. When a highly cyclical company, earnings can be all over the place, but the balance sheet earns the profits in the long term. Um, and then the DCF is your long-term view, looking at the full cycle, the evolution of the business, the decline of the business, the eventually ex-growth, terminal growth year of the business, and if all of those three models start to agree with each other, it's comfortable. Um, but what often happens is, let me give it a good example of, uh, for example, a BHP, a BHP bulletin, um, where right now, you know, you might be earning below mean, so you're, on a price earnings basis, it maybe looks expensive. On a price to book basis, it looks incredibly cheap, and on the DCF, maybe it looks fairly valued, because it's taking into account both sides of it. Um, so, in a nutshell, yes, you're right. And that then comes to, to the next one, uh, again from Caroline. It, it, can't you take the business and, and, and figure out its cycle, and, and mining is going to be more cyclical than, than retail, for example, and say, well, their growth for the last uh, X years has been 14%, and therefore throw those in your assumptions, and the question is, how many years? Well, l l let, me, let me be a little bit of a jerk here and throw in a complication this doesn't work in a mining company. Don't forget, mining companies have finite assets. The way you would value BHP Burton, and maybe the previous example was a bit of a bad one, the way you would value it is you'd value every single mine as a finite DCF individually, add them all up, and, and perhaps give a bit of a premium for their, their uh, growth pipeline or the portfolio prospecting portfolio and what they find, what they don't, you know, 10% here, 5% there, whatever, and, and you arrive at a sum of parts. So for a mining company, that wouldn't work. Uh, for c because it's a finite uh, like um, an asset. So in a mining company, you actually wouldn't have a terminal here. But in in let's use a highly cyclical company, perhaps a um, Baller World or or a Bidfest. You know, quite a cyclical company. I suppose lots of industries, lots of different moving parts. Goes up, it goes down. Earnings are a little bit all over the place. In in that case. Um, it starts to become incredibly challenging, you know, and, and I can tell you this honestly as an analyst, forecasting one year's earnings out is tough enough. Try to forecast five or ten and where it will be up or down and where it will be. That starts to become really, really challenging. So what you tend to do is you tend to moderate your assumptions. So you tend to start working on averages where um, over five years it may be up 100% one year, down 50% the other year, 30% up the next year, this, that. But the average is across time about a 10% or 20% year on year growth. So you start to work with averages because forecasting cycles, and especially the further and further we look in the time, uh, forward in the time period, is just incredibly hard. It just, you know, um, I haven't yet met an analyst who can do that properly. Yeah, and that then feeds into Sabu's question, which is, don't the, the level of assumptions required in DCF reduce reliance on DCF? And, and his, his, his point, he goes further on, he says part of the reason he's here is because he's, he's never got his head around that and he can't see the value in it because there's so many assumptions. Well, uh, uh, I hate to agree with your question, but I don't like DCFs. 
for the very fact that uh, there are too many moving parts. Remember when I, when I touched back on the graph and or the, the example and I mentioned all the, all the assumptions, well, all of those assumptions have other assumptions. EBITDA is a factor of, of revenue growth, the factor of, GD, uh, of cost of sales, which is, uh, which is gross profit margin, forecasting that. Uh, well, what is your operating cost based inflation? Because that creates operating profit. How much capex are you spending that, that implies uh, there are simply too many assumptions. This is an incredibly useful tool and it's particularly useful for companies where their short term earnings might be under or overvaluing them. So you can see through just the one year, two year time horizon. You can see into the five, ten, twenty year time horizon. But I would and then we, and without, there are numerous exceptions, um, but I would not use, because of the complexity and the number of moving parts and assumptions at DCF, I would not use it in isolation for that single fact. Double check yourself, the other valuation models. Yeah, and that's exactly what Mike then asks. Mike says, so we throw it all in a pot. Uh, we, we put in EV Badar, we put in parts to books, we put in PEs, maybe we put in pegs and throw everything into a pot and, and, and see what the consensus is more than anything else? Well, this is, this is my approach. I, I often use what I call a blended fair value or a blended target price, which is just the fair value roll forward for a year. And, and the blending is simply choosing the most appropriate valuation models and often weighting them or equally weighting them, which is just an average, and coming up with something that's in between. Because uh, you're getting the best perspective of all the worlds and often you know the more valuation models you use and the more correctly you use them the blend of a fair value often you know, starts, to, starts to talk in, in my opinion uh, the truth of that valuation another question coming through uh, I need to put my glasses on oh, uh, terminal year uh, you say you use GDP but GDP is two and a half percent for the company, even at terminals, growing better than that. Ah, uh, yes, yes. The complication. Notice this terminal years in three years' time. Now, if you're doing a DCF, I like to do five, ten, twenty-year DCFs. You actually can't use current real GDP growth. You've actually got to use, um, you know, GDP growth, uh, what you expect in five or ten years' time. This is where macroeconomics come into play. Uh, in South Africa's case. Uh, what I tend to use is I tend to peg it between three and four percent. So as as a as a rule of thumb on the JSC with companies that have most of their operations locally, um, I'd recommend between three and four percent, especially if you're whack and your cost of equity is taken into contemplation. You're actually using real GDP and not nominal GDP. Um, so yes, we we're currently in quite a depressed growth environment. But what will it be in five, ten, fifteen, twenty years time? And that's where you start to use uh, these macroeconomic assumptions. So, so like I said, one of the major risks in, in the DCF is, is really a terminal growth rate. I mean, in this example, there's 71% of net present value. If I wanted to make Keith Empire a bar or a sell, all I had to do was change my assumption in terminal growth here, and I would swing this price up and down. And this, this is some of the, the, the tools of the trade that analysts use to manipulate their reports to show what they want. So be careful of that too. Okay, there's a question there about inflation, but I think you've just answered it. Inflation is sitting in that. In that oh, yeah, there. sorry. Uh, let me touch on this. And there's so many aspects to this that are trying to complicate it. But the way I've taught DCF uh, is I've taught it with the cost of with inflation captured into the discount rate. And then you use your growth rates as real growth rates. Now, there's another way to do this. You can do your cost of equity in your WAC on a real interest rate. So your discount factor will be higher uh, because your discount rate will be um, lower. But then you have to factor inflation into each of your forecast years. I find it simpler just simply to factor it in now. Yeah, good point. Uh, question asking where the other videos are. Just hit just one lap.com slip DCF into the search box and they will pop up. Otherwise, click on valuations and you will get absolutely all of them. The question coming through is, 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 is uh, from, from, uh, uh, from Michael again, is looking at, at, at the higher level of complexity, this one, price to book to a lesser degree, EBITDA, EV, EBITDA, et cetera, surely the simplistic ones like 
price earnings and dividend yields, and even to a degree PEG, become obsolete? Yes and no. Um, the, the complication with teacher valuations is that evaluation is always a, a generic approach, but every company you value and every asset you value is unique. So you have to start to consider, and this is like uh, Simon and I were chatting about this earlier, where probably in, in, in the new year I will do a, a, a webinar in the series where we will talk about which valuations are which applicable when. And I haven't really touched on that. But, and we use case studies, and this company, have a look at that, and that company, have a look at that, and, and give more credence, more weight to, um, to, to different valuations. But to discard an entire valuation methodology as obsolete is too extreme. I would certainly apply as many as possible and think carefully. I mean, a, 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 an example is a highly cyclical company where earnings are depressed right now might be trading at a huge price earnings. But their forward price earnings might be really, really low. And you might only pick it up if you did DCF and you look through the cycle. Or if you did a price to book and you saw that they have a strong balance sheet. So to discard any valuation methodology is, is perhaps too extreme. You have to approach each company and each asset and each valuation as unique and apply logic. doesn't mean you have to use every single one on every single valuation and every single uh, share or asset, but it, it, it certainly helps. Cool. Folks, we'll leave it there because we have just slipped past the 30 minutes and questions have come up. A last question, which I will take. So you keep on referring to through the cycle. What do you mean by that? Well, <laughs> this, is, this is where I disagree with um, business textbooks. And, and, and I love academics. They're great. They give us other degrees and they make us uh, sound really, really intelligent. But the business cycle is not this pretty graph that you draw that goes up and down. Uh, it, Everybody's looking forward, so uh, the cycle often guesses itself. But in reality, um, things are volatile. So there will be boom periods and there will be bust periods, periods of expansion and periods of contraction. Uh, and even, and that's at a macroeconomic level, even at a, at a macroeconomic level, on a company per company basis, a, a company, like a good example, is a business connection. Business Connection has gone through about a three-year three period of heavy reinvestment to the company, acquiring strong businesses, trying to build a proper presence. Now, now if you look at the free cash flow model, um, there, there's a line item in CapEx, and when, when I value these highly acquisitive uh, companies, I actually include another line item called acquisitive outflows, where they pay cash for other companies because they're buying free cash flows. But, it, but you would have had strong free cash flow outflows and at the same time coupled with a share price that, that, that um, is, is factoring in all of that, but earnings that are depressed. So you would have a, a really, really high price earnings. So if you value them just on the price earnings, you'd miss the boat. You wouldn't understand what's coming. Um, and, and sorry, not, not punting a business connection in this case, but just using them as an example because I was just working on them the other day. Uh, where through the cycle is this macroeconomic cycles, but there's also macroeconomic cycles, where the specific companies go through periods of heavy reinvestments, where they absorb profits and absorb uh, free cash flows for future benefits. Um, and then you go through the opposite, where companies get lazy, their free cash flows expand incredibly, um, and, and their bottom line looks incredible, but it's not necessarily sustainable. And a good example of that is pick and pay. Pick and pay in the last uh, decade, decade and a half, or maybe half a decade, they didn't reinvest strongly into the business. So their bottom line looked fantastic. Uh, the price earnings looked really, really low, but it's because they weren't investing into a dis uh, centralized distribution system. They weren't reinvesting into Africa. They were wasting money in Australia. They were wasting, they were wasting things like that, but they were just actually propping up short-term profits uh, for well, their own motives. I'm not, I'm not going to go into that. If you value them on the price earnings and then look through the cycle at, at the worrying signs about the lack of reinvestment in the business, you would have heavily overvalued them. And that's what I mean by looking through the cycle. It's, it's a generic term, but I don't just mean it on a macroeconomic basis. Understand the individual company you're valuing.
the individual company's valuation is actually more important. It's influenced by the macroeconomic events and cycles, but it's not dictated by them. And that's what I mean by through the cycle, both ma macro and macroeconomics. Yeah, that's a good shot, and I think we can pay with a, a good answer. Ladies and gents, we'll leave it there. My thanks to, to Keith, as always, and my thanks to you. As we said, we'll be back uh, first half December, and we'll do the, the case study, which will be uh, ISA Holdings. Thanks, guys, for listening through all the jargon. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks for the good questions.